Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. Before we get to today's episode, we want to take a quick moment and let you know that CityWorks Expo 8, anticipating 2050 acting today, uh, will be occurring October 4th through 6th in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, We've got some really exciting speakers and some other activities lined up that we're excited about. If you all are interested, please check us out at CityWorksExpo.com. That's CityWorksXPO.com. And real quick before we get to today's episode, just want to let you all know that we'd really appreciate if you could give us a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening to this, whether that be Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever else you might be finding it. This rating and review really help other people find out about the podcast and the incredible guests that we have. But now, without further ado, let's get on to today's episode. Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and I'll be your host today. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Nick Tilson, founding executive director of the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation and founder of NDN Collective. How are you doing today, Nick? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. The, thanks for having me on here. Of course, it's an absolute pleasure. I, I've heard great things about your work, and I look forward to chatting more. But I wonder if you could kind of start us off by uh, kind of how you define the work that you do. For sure. So yeah, the work that we do is we're a we're a, a place based organ. Thunder Valley is a place based organization that really grew out of a movement of young people reconnecting to our culture and identity, and and now we're building climate resilient. The, the climate resilient communities of tomorrow, um, and part of that also is the revitalization of our of our culture through our indigenous language and the building of local food systems, and um, building collective power through building community and meeting the needs of our mm-hmm. of, of our community and our people. Um, that's how we pretty much define the work that we're doing. Hmm. Well, I think it's fascinating because you guys really think very broadly about what this means and really work comprehensively. You guys are involved in, it seems like, every step of of what needs to happen to make uh, the places you work better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that we, um, you know, I mean, I think our story and like our work has been that we come from this place of extreme inequity and, and extreme poverty and that we recognize that the most powerful um, people to answer these problems is us, the mm-hmm. people that are most impacted, who have had the lived experience, who are from the challenges. And so that's why Thunder Valley, you know, is an organization that is not a charity. We're about change. Mm-hmm. So we're about changing systems, so entire systems that can help um, address the needs of our people, create jobs, build community wealth and build equity um for 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 ourselves and and for the for the whole country because i think that you know the 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 poverty that has existed in our community is uh has a byproduct of an unsustainable system and so as we think about systems we recognize that we have to we have to dive really deep and, and and really knock down silos between sectors um which is a very indigenous way of thinking because um, I've had the opportunity to, to, to meet many, many different indigenous um, people from many, many different indigenous communities. And I, I have yet to find an indigenous community that in their language doesn't have something that says that we are all related, mm-hmm. that we're all connected, that all living things are, are related to one another. In my language, in Lakota, we say, yase, which means that we are all related. And and, that, and 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 that's true for indigenous communities all over the place. So in our in our work in tackling these problems, we're sort of calling upon our our old school indigenous um, ideology and values, and then incorporating them into modern modern technology and those worlds colliding together. In our in our hopes that by doing that, um, we actually build equity and improve quality of life and do good things for the planet and the earth at the same time. Hmm. 
That's that's so fascinating. I really it really resonates for me from the sense that I, I think that as I look at our communities here, you know, we're based in Virginia, but any number of places I visit that, and even on a national level, it seems like we've lost a, a collective sense of being in some ways, and that you guys, a big part of what you're doing is trying to reinstill or regrasp what that collective sense means. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, if, if, if you think about it in this sense, like, it's a very human, it's a very human thing, to want and desire to be something, a part of something bigger than yourself. That's why, like, human beings started organizing tribes a long time ago, was because, you know, this idea of tribalism, about being a part of something bigger than yourself, and then that tying, you know, to your sense of identity. And if you have a strong sense of identity and a strong commitment to place, then all of a sudden you have a strong purpose in life. And... So I think that like a lot of this work, like it's really simple thinking in some ways of like, if you can engage community and organize community and to do it in a way that gives people a sense of, um, a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, a sense of place in this world, I think that there's, you know, I think that's, I think that's something that people are uh, calling for all around the world, you know, and you know, our our work is doing that in the setting of being Lakota, in the setting of being indigenous, in the setting that we're doing here amongst, you know, very, very extreme challenges that we're against. But our lessons learned in doing this work, um, the ideas can inform inform development decisions and inform community engagement decisions and inform things all around the world in hopes that we end up building more interconnected systems between all people and the planet. Hmm. Can you, uh, can we, I think it's probably appropriate for those of our listeners that aren't familiar with where you guys do work. Can you give us a sense of the context of uh, where you guys do your work and, and what it's like uh, before and what you guys have been able to accomplish in some ways? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, uh, we're located on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which is in like the southwestern corner of south dakota uh pine ridge is about a 50 by 90 mile area um one of the largest indian reservations in um in the country um close to three million acres roughly thirty thousand people spread out over a, an area about the size of delaware mm. um and you know this is this is ground zero for poverty and inequity in america and it's you know we've had hovering unemployment rates between 60 and 70 percent for the past you know 200 years since the reservations were created and we are in the process of trying to upend that poverty into um create different systems so the context that's where the context is that we come from and our you know the the, the my people you know the, of this region we're oglala lakota so lakota is our linguistic group Oglala is our band. Um, his history has inaccurately um, has inaccurately given us a, a, a name that people might be familiar with of being um, Sioux. Um, but we're the people of the Great Plains and the people of that 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 roam, that that lived on this earth hunting buffalo. And um, this, you know, we're the the people of the Great Plains, and this is our region. How and you guys have it's amazing to see the work that you guys have been able to do and I think that you know for those of us that live on the coast it's hard to kind of imagine what that what that world is like I remember growing up uh, in seventh grade my parents took us on a trip across the country and I remember as we were coming back through the southern parts of the states uh, going through um, you know some of the Navajo reservation and then up up we visited made a point to visit wounded knee uh, as we were going out and just it's a it's an entirely different context that I think is so hard for some of us on the coast to imagine and you guys uh, have been able to do some incredible work in there and I, I, I wonder uh, can you share a, a bit about what that work has been and, and what successes you all have had yeah so I, I can share um, share a little bit about that um, Thunder Valley has been doing a, a wide variety of different work um, but what we really did is we started organizing in our community because we were basically community organizers and sort of organizing in our community and start asking big, bold questions about what we wanted to see happen for our community and for our people. And 
that that process has informed and continues to inform um, our work. And so we, you know, we looked at some of the biggest challenges, and so we decided to actually build a community from scratch because we have a huge housing shortage here, almost 4,000 units. There's an mm-hmm. average of 16 people living in a three-bedroom house on Pine Ridge. Um, and But we also recognized that, like, when we looked at the development projects that did happen, there were always, like, one-off projects, and there wasn't, like, actual community being built, and there wasn't mixed income or mixed use, and, you know, and so you had these sort of islands of different things going on. So we engaged the community in a pretty radical process to to plan, design, and then build an entire 21st century indigenous community from scratch. And um, and so we have actually we have 34 acres of uh, 34 acres of land. We have did master planning. We have brought infrastructure, including water, sewer, roads, fiber, electricity. Mm-hmm. And and then now what's starting to come out of that is um, housing, single-family housing, multi-family housing. You know, when I look out to our development out here now, we have you know seven seven homes under construction. We have uh, a 12-unit apartment complex under construction. We have a community center under constru- under construction. There's about three million dollars of um, there's about thank you, thanks, Billy. There's about three million dollars of um, infrastructure that's in the ground that's going to help other future development happen um and so you know our work was about finding ways to bring new types of capital into our community in philanthropy and investment and but meanwhile still maintaining that connection to community and organizing um and and also doing that work you know by not retreating from the values of being Lakota or from the values of being indigenous, but doing development in a work and so that the community reflects who we are mm-hmm. and our commitment to place and our identity and our creativity and our culture. Um, and so that, you know, that work has been a huge part of it. We also have, an, uh, well, we have, we have a theory of change and its theory of change um, includes uh, the ecosystem of opportunity. So we don't believe in in solving problems just by creating one program and making that one program work really good. We actually have nine different initiatives, um, and those nine different initiatives include social enterprise, workforce development, community regenerative community development, housing and home ownership, food sovereignty. Lakota language revitalization, youth leadership development, regional equity, arts and culture. Um, and these um, nine different initiatives are actually um, part of this whole ecosystem that is creating eco- an ecosystem of opportunity that begins to uplift our people. Um, and so that is, the, that is the, the nature and the context of our work. And, you know, it, it, it aligns completely with, um, you know, um, international goals of sustainability. Like, you know, when you look at the, uh, the concept and idea of can we honor the past, can we meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs? And we feel like that's what we're doing here. And in many ways, um it's been an awesome journey, and I've been able to see so many people's lives get changed by it. But I also think the cool thing about it is it's a learning community. So it's a place of constant learning about what is the, you know what does the future of the planet look like? How do we want to live in uh, in a society in the world with a symbiotic relationship between each other from different you know races and groups in a, in an equitable way but also how do we want to have that continued relationship with the environment at hmm. the same time that's so compelling of a vision and i love uh, hearing that you guys have articulated this very clear uh pathway forward and a very clear theory of change and i wonder how did you guys go about identifying those nine areas that need to be uh, initiatives that need to be started and and kind of what was that process for determining what that theory of change should look like yeah so um 
community engagement in, in multifaceted levels, right? So, um, you know, you can do community engagement where you're like, I'm going to have a community meeting, I'm going to get input, and then I'm just going to go do whatever I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not what we did. You know, being grassroots organizers and really understanding, like, how hard it is to actually get anything done here, um, you really, like, because if you don't, you know, this place has also been, like, lied to. There's a whole history of, like, a system of oppression in which our people, every agreement that's ever been made with our people has been broken, you know? every, And so we are ending up in this situation where even though we're from here, people are skeptic, skeptical right away, and rightfully so, given history, mm. you know? So we started doing robust community engagement process where we would do different types of community engagement. You know, we would do community planning. We did regional planning where the community planning was specifically about the specific community that we're trying to build. Regional planning had to do with setting some goals for the entire region, where we're trying to get to. And, you know, that through both of those processes, we engaged, you know, close to 3,000 people. It's pretty much like the, the biggest community organizing um community organizing um, project in the region ever, you know, and um, and so organizing that many people and getting that, the, the opi- opinions, and I think putting people around tables that don't normally get along, you know, put, put the director of the housing authority across the table from the, the grandma who's been on the waiting list for 10 years mm-hmm. and put the, the second grader you know, around the table with the director of transportation, put people around the table to really start um, cultivating ideas and to break, break down silos between us so that we can actually figure out what it is that we want. Because if we don't have a clear vision of where we want to get, then our organizations and our governments and our systems aren't going to do a very good job of, mm-hmm. of getting there if we don't know what the destination looks like. Um, so... We did it through that way. We also did creative things because we understand that, like, a lot of times, like, people don't engage um, artists. They don't engage, engage the culture bearers, the creative thinkers um, in doing development work. And so we actually created an artist advisory council. And that artist advisory council um, was made up of folks that were uh, – a person who was a medicine man, somebody who was a bead worker, somebody who was a quill worker, performing artists like Frank Wan and, and uh, another another band called Scatter Their Own and um, local painters and ledger artists and getting these different interpreters of our culture around um, the table and in- intermingling them within our architecture and our planning and our design teams so that we can really have something that is a true reflection of what we're trying to do. So finding multiple ways to do community engagement and engage different types of engagement. You know, we also did design charrettes with communities so people could like put their concepts and ideas into the design of buildings and um, into the design of the neighborhood and buildings and all these things. Um, you know, and so that's how a lot of how we have gotten there is by valuing that one of our most important forms of capital is actually our human capital and the mm-hmm. people. Um, that is the most powerful thing, you know, is the people. And and that's what this represents. I always say Thunder Valley is not about the buildings that you're starting to see go up or the, you know, even the jobs that we're creating and all the things happening those are a result of having built community power. Hmm. That's uh, that's really fascinating. I wonder, have you found that, you know, you mentioned when you when you were talking that that you guys have been lied to and every agreement that's come down from above that you get has been broken with you all. Have you guys been able to uh, establish some trust that has allowed you guys to then uh, really expand these efforts in some ways? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think we, I think we have, I think that, you know, in some of our partnerships with our tribal government here, like we, we have helped our tribal government further along some of their thinking around 
regional planning and about how do you you know look at regions and i think that did did a lot because our 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 our, our tribe and our region didn't really have a vision for what it wanted, wanted for its future and um, Thunder Valley partnered with the Oglala Sioux Tribe to create the Oglala Lakota Plan that became the regional sustainable development plan for the entire region. And since that time, the tribe has been able to leverage new investments into water infrastructure, new investments into housing, new investments into education in these other areas. Um, and they should get full-on credit for doing that. We just helped expedite the process in, in helping um, – put it into a vision and I think that plus when you actually people actually start to see physical things like houses being built and jobs being created and trust is built when people's lives are impacted mm-hmm. period and I wouldn't trust us if we weren't impacting people's lives you know and I think that over time you know being around now we've been around for a decade we didn't just start yesterday even though it feels like it um that having this steady consistency of like we're not going away we're not going to we're not going to stop pushing the envelope and we're not going to go away we're going to keep being scrappy we're going to keep fighting we're going to keep staying consistent and that uh and and I feel like absolutely that we have um we have created a proven track record and that has created um the ability for our work um, to be trusted by people in the community and that we also create places and situations for people to challenge us too. You know, like we, we, we always want to be improving ourselves and having a feedback loop that allows us to analyze what are we doing? What are we not doing? How do we can, how do we do what we're doing better? And as long as we keep having that culture of being learners, you know, the culture that, that, we that we have the humility to admit what we don't know, and therefore it puts us, it it makes all of us into students. And I think that that also creates trust too, because then people realize, you know, that it's actually not just about this organization. In fact, it's actually about the community. The organization is just a tool, and that tool allows us to further ourselves and our people and community along. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering, and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students supply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you. But I I imagine that you guys aren't the first people that have gone into some of these conversations about let's do some regional planning, let's do some charrettes. How have you guys been able to contextualize that stuff to make it relevant, uh, but also something that people uh, feel comfortable taking part in? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Like, it, and I, I I think what's important to differentiate is we engaged in those things as community organizers. So, for example, in the structure of going in those things, Thunder Valley partnered with the Oglala Sioux Tribe, but Thunder Valley, a grassroots organization, received a whole bunch of money, like received a $900,000 grant to do regional planning on behalf of the whole region in partnership with the tribe through this consortium. So you have to understand the structure of doing something like that, it totally was like upset the status quo because all of a sudden you had this small group of organizers who are leading the planners, who are leading the organizing and planning efforts, and we are a grassroots organization. It wasn't the tribe receiving like a big grant and saying, hey, you guys should do this. So I think that's an important fundamental thing of like why this is different is because not only did we do community organizing and planning 
we had the opportunity as grassroots people to make sure that the planning and charrette and all that process was um was was structured in a way to have us have an have a clear outcome so that you so that as we come out of these things we have clear marching orders and so you know honestly it made people it made a lot of government officials it made maybe people representing our tribal government other places sometimes it made them uncomfortable because the the power the power was decentralized essentially during the process um but i'm a big like i'm a big believer in that right so i think that when you do community planning and doing charrette it makes a big difference not just that you do it but it makes a huge difference of how you do it and um and then also recognizing that hey it's one thing to create a plan but you have to have you know what how what, no matter how ambitious your plan is you have to have 10 times of ambition to to implement that plan because if we don't begin implementing that plan and demonstrating that implementing a plan is real then that plan will lose pow- that will, that plan will lose power and it will sit on a shelf and it will still collecting dust and the sad part is when you take that plan out 20 years later and you dust it off because it sat there for so long, all the things that are in that plan, sadly, are they're going to still be relevant. Mm. And so, you know, we set out on this ambitious thing of let's create this awesome plan for our community and for our people and have the end goal being that this plan needs to be redone down the road. It has to be redone because if it doesn't need to be, that means we're not doing our job. Mm. Hmm. That's, uh, you know, I wish more organizations thought that way in terms of uh, we need to work ourselves out of existence in some ways. We shouldn't need to exist in the form that we are right now. I wonder, kind of, how do you guys? Uh, we've seen some organizations. I was just talking to someone earlier about a local one that started with very grassroots, uh, at a very grassroots level, and we're doing things like you guys were doing in terms of community organizing, and then when they become more established. Uh, it becomes uh, an entity, uh, not necessarily of oppression, but one that uh, that is not necessarily listening as well as it once did. How have you guys, I know you've talked a little bit about making sure that you're always open and encouraging feedback, but how have you guys made sure that you've stayed relevant with that very grassroots level of input? I mean, I think it's, I think it's like people aren't going to only go to so many meetings, you know? Hmm. Um and so I guess our en- our engagement started taking um, a new form because as we decided to um, start implementing projects, all of a sudden people's engagement became different things. So we started a workforce program to 18 to 26-year-old young people. You know who our biggest recruiters were to get young people into those programs? Around here, it was the grandmas and the grandpas hmm. of those 18 to 26 year old young people and they were the ones who were saying hey you better sign up for that workforce program they're going to teach you something and that's when you know that like because then also the engagement's differently right so somebody who was like well i'm not going to live in that development i'm not going to do this like i'm not going to be a part of that thing that's being built down there but they might have a young relative that wants to be that that needs to improve their life and so all of a sudden their engagement become from us looks differently and so, um, and so I think making sure that you're creating programming that is relevant, that meets the needs of where people are at, no matter where they're at, um, ends up becoming an awesome way for people to, to engage with your organization because um, you show that, hey, although we have big dreams and we're working towards those things, that it's not like some destination of like, oh, one day this community is going to be built and then hey, we all celebrate. It's like, no, actually, all this programming, all this programming that we're doing in social enterprise and workforce development and housing and home ownership and food sovereignty, these are giving multiple avenues of people to engage and stay connected to our work and engage with the organization. And then by engaging with the organization, then all of a sudden, they really begin to see, take pride in what this organization is doing in, in, diff, in you know all over the place and so i think that part um is really fundamental 
and you know also like if something's delayed like there's no reason to hide anything you just tell the people you know Mm -hmm. and so like we have website we have a huge presence on social media we have a local we have a weekly radio show that we're on the radio for an hour every single week um there's multiple different forms of communication and for ways for people to interact with us and be a part of our work. Um, so I think those things are sort of a, um, you know, a accumulation of a lot of things. Have you found that through all of this, through being an agent that actively listens and through doing following through on the work that you guys do and, and, and helping build this shared vision that people have articulated, have you found that there's a – uh, a renewed sense of possibility. Have you found that there's a bit of a mindset change in some ways? Absolutely. That's been that's been um that's been that's been huge. Um you know, I think that, you know, you see you see folks who say, Oh, I, I can never own a home, you know. I'm only making, you know you know, X amount of money and all of a sudden, they start going through a financial literacy class. They start going through um, you know, a credit education class. All of these classes that we have, the education that we do here, and then people start people can start seeing themselves in what we're trying to do here. Then that's when you see people's mind shift. And I think that you know when I talk about that we're about change, not charity. A lot of what we're talking about is. If you show up here and you just say, How, what is this organization going to do to help me? My question, Dabak, is what are you going to do to help yourself? Because hmm. all we are is a toolbox. And if you think that we're some organization that's going to change your whole life around, you're wrong. But if you're somebody who wants to change your life around, we definitely got some tools for you definitely got some tools for you and and so that's a whole different relation you know that's a whole different mind frame and i think that i think that what the you know the the story ends up being over time of like you know in the nonprofit world we do a terrible job at using language like financial inclusion and equity and like all of these different things when at the end of the day what we're doing is we're empowering people to change their own lives and to become the curators and the architects of their future. And, um, and if we're effectively doing that, then they're changing, they're making behavior, behavioral changes. They're making lifestyle choices. And you know what? They're working hard. They're putting work in for the betterment of, the, of, their, of their own lives and their people. And then our organization actually has the ability to be effective in building up that person. And so I think changing mind frames, you know, I have a young guy here who's 27 years old, grew up in evergreen housing, you know, subsidized housing down the road, had a challenging, challenging lifestyle. Um, And he came in here and he used almost every single tool that we offered to him. And... 27 years old, he closed on his mortgage. Mm. He's building a house here. Next month, he's going to start. He's, he's going to be part of launching a worker-owned construction company that he's going to be not just working for, but part owner in. And yeah, sure. Like, of course, as a nonprofit, we can wave the flag and say, "Look at you know, look at how great we are." I'm like, look at how powerful he is. Look how courageous he is. We are merely a toolbox to help make that happen, and a very important part of the toolbox because a mechanic without any tools is going to have a challenge. But this, you know, that story of his mind frame, he decided that he wanted something different for his future, and he was courageous and hungry enough to go after it. And we were just as crazy, crazy and hungry and courageous enough to walk by his side and make sure he had the tools to do what he had to do. Um, so, you know, stories like that of people's mind frames and evolving and changing, you know, powerful. That's what the heart of the work is about. Hmm. Oh, 
it's such a compelling story. I, you know, I'm intrigued too that there's, you know, in this, we talk a lot about empowerment, I think, these days without necessarily always understanding totally what it means. And I think that, you know, you, you mentioned earlier a little bit about how you guys were shifting that power dynamic back to the grassroots. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hearing that this, you know, you, with this gentleman's story that he's regaining that power individually, but you guys are also regaining power as a community. And I wonder that often changes in those power dynamics make people uncomfortable. And I want you wonder how you guys have been able to handle that discomfort and, and, and make those changes in a way that uh, doesn't totally upset the boat or when it's, when it's necessary, you do upset the boat. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a craft. I feel like if you're not upsetting the boat, then, you know, <laughs> Uh, what are you doing? Uh, my grandpa, my grandpa, Ken Tilson, he was a civil rights, he was a civil rights attorney and a attorney for the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the American Indian movement. And he used to always say, Hey, if you're not pissing somebody off, you know, if you're not pissing somebody off, you might not be doing something that's worth a damn. <laughs> and um, I appreciate the, you know, his like his teaching and candor in that because I think part of it is like the status quo needs to be disrupted, and the status quo because the status quo obviously has not meet the needs of our people. Hmm. The status quo has destroyed the environment. The status quo has created a, a, a wealth gap between the rich and the poor in this country. The wealth, the status quo has created polarized politics. The status quo is doing these stuff. So, you know, absolutely in every step of the way, our work needs to needs to challenge the status quo. We need to keep asking why not. And until the new answer is yes we can. And and so I think that that in this work it's about the intentionality. Right? So if you have intentionality that your intentions are not to just build a community center. Your intentions in building that community center is to challenge the power structure of why that wasn't able to happen in the past. And therefore, the building of that community center ends up being something that is tenfold than it was before. You're both meeting the needs because you definitely stand up in front of your people and said, we're going to build a community center. <laughs> but at the same time, you have created new you know, opportunity for other people um, and have ch- began a challenging power structures. And uh, I think that I, I feel like our work is really starting to head in sort of that power shifting paradigm because this model, you know, this place based model of Thunder Valley has begun to be uplifted as a national and sometimes even an international model of building resilient communities and what, what's possible when you do that. Um, and therefore, you know, that's why I like my next work and my next in, endeavor um, as, I, as I grow this work is to, is to challenge the power structure of philanthropy, to challenge the power structure of social impact investment. Because as, as grateful as I am that Thunder Valley has been able to do what we're doing as, as a result of, um, you know, philanthropy and, and social impact investing, it's a shame that Thunder Valley currently is an anomaly, that it is the exception to the rule. And to me, I'm like, this needs to be disrupted because in order for this kind of radical change to spawn and, and spread all throughout Indian country and to indigenous communities and low-income communities everywhere, we have to challenge the power structure and, we ha- and, and, and the, the financial structure is a big part of that too. Well, that, I imagine that goes into some of the work that you're moving into now with the NDN Collective. And I wonder, could you speak a little bit about what your goals and hopes are for that? Yeah, so the NDN Collective, you know, kind of operates in three spheres of work. You know, we are, we are natives developing nations, natives decolonizing nations, um, and natives defending nations. And sort of this idea of development of Indian nations, the defending of our nations, because many of those are intertwined with natural resources, and the decolonization and revitalization of our of our ceremonies is an uh, important part of that. So th- these three bodies and spheres of work um, is is where was what the NDN collective is going to uh, focus on, and why we're creating it, and why I'm transitioning from the executive director. Um, into 
uh, the executive director into um, into the Indian Collective is because we've had over 70 different indigenous communities reach out to us over the past two years, wanting to do something similar to what we're doing at Thunder Valley in their communities. And, um, and for the most part, like Thunder Valley hasn't really had the capacity to help those communities. We've been really focused on the place-based work that we're doing here. And so the Indian Collective is actually going to be a collective of about four different entities that will be able to drive an increase of philanthropic investment into Indigenous-led organizations, drive an increased social impact investment in the form of um, equity investments and loans into communities, the um, the idea of building capacity, of building stronger Indigenous-led organizations, and um, and then the the, the third the third component or the fourth component is Indian action, which is an advocacy and action component of this collective, so that we can begin to move the political dial around issues that are impacting Indigenous people. And together, you know, the collective, the the collective's big goal and mission is to build the collective power of Indigenous peoples um, to exercise our inherent right to self-determination while fostering a world that is built on the foundation of justice and equity for all people and the planet. And so it's a big, crazy vision that, you know, can Indigenous self-determination and Indigenous self-sovereignty through an equity lens um, create radical change in this country and around the world. And so this, um, this new collective that I'm in the process of building is a tool, a toolbox at a whole nother level. Hmm. You know, there is the, there's a toolbox here, the place based toolbox that Thunder Valley has built for Thunder Valley. And so we want to have, you know, we want to, we dream of an Indian country one day where there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of organizations like Thunder Valley that are creating radical change in their community. Well, for that to happen, you need a toolbox. And the Indian Collective and its related entities are going to be that toolbox. And it also is going to get ways for philanthropy and investment to engage in indigenous communities in ways that they have never have historically, ever. Hmm. That's, that's such a compelling vision. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm already... Uh, feeling excited for that new work that you're going to be doing. And I wonder, I imagine not everyone is so excited that, you know, I imagine you run into people that are telling you, uh, shouldn't you be content with what you've been accomplished so far? Or, you know, how can you even begin to think about these this broader level of things? How do you kind of continue to stay energized and continue to think big in the face of such big challenges? I mean, I think there's kind of two parts to that question. I think this, the first part of like, you know, <laughs> why move on, you know, and part of it is I just believe that like to change the world that we're in, we have to create institutions of radical change mm -hmm. and that institutions of radical change. If your president, founder, CEO is still your president <laughs> founder, CEO, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years later, one should question ourselves, are we an organization of radical change, <laughs> you know? Um, because I think that leadership is something that is important in the progression of radical change. And leadership is something that is important that we recognize that when a leader is standing around in a group of leaders, it's important to value that and to value what everybody is bringing to the table. And so, you know, my transition comes at a time where, one, absolutely, I want to scale impact to other places throughout Indian country, and I want to create change, and I want to make sure that, um, that one day Thunder Valley is the standard, not the exception, you know. And, um, but also it's a recognition of the amazing people that I work with. And I am deeply honored and humbled to work with the creators and the innovators and the hardworking people of the, you know, over, you know, close to 100 employees that Thunder Valley employs on an annual basis now that are creating, you know, a lot of change in their community. 
people that are passionate about the Lakota language, people that are passionate about food sovereignty, the hardworking crew that's building the houses, um, the folks that are focusing on regional equity, the folks in social enterprise, creating social enterprises. Um, every one of these groups of people, you know, and our, our awesome, you know, home ownership team that is assisting families in the process of getting into mortgages and getting into homes. They, all these people are working so hard and I believe in them so much and I appreciate them. And that's why I think that like my transition is in a full faith. The other thing too is like, if anybody were to think that I would ever walk away from this organization <laughs> and, uh, not ensure its future uh, are, uh, are crazy because I know I've been around long enough to recognize that like there's something special happening here. And so my transition is merely going on to the board of directors and um, my role on the board of directors is to set, set good goals for this organization, raise good money for this organization and keep having contributions for this, you know, for this organization. Um, and, you know, I think that, I think that the same honest to God thing that keeps me going that that is fueling the creation of this next thing is when I look at how great we are doing when it, and I look that what we're doing is not possible unless we create radical change on in in in, in these other sectors and so for me as an organizer because that's the thing that sometimes people forget about me like I didn't have a background in business I didn't know anything about development I didn't know hardly anything about those things. I was a community organizer from Porcupine right here on Pine Ridge and just learned that stuff. So I've always sort of uh, approached the work with how am I going to change the system or what door am I going to kick down, you know? And I just feel like it's a continuation of this work because now I want to kick down some doors so that I can start opening opportunity up for all of Indian country, not just Pine Ridge. Mm. And also, I think that in the kicking down of these doors and creating opportunity for all of people, that that will absolutely <laughs> ensure a future for all of Indian country and Indian country you know, includes what's happening at Thunder Valley. Mm. Well, it's, uh, I'm excited to see what happens next. And I wonder... You know, I kind of hate to start bringing us to a close. There seems like so much more we could talk about. But I wonder if you could kind of uh, share something that uh, you've learned along the way that was kind of unexpected or something that really sticks with you now as you as you look ahead. Two things I wanted to say, like two quick stories that embody that answer that question. I've always been in a hurry. Ask anybody in my whole life, anybody around me that I work with, my family, whoever, I'm always in a hurry, trying to go here, trying to go there. How come it's not done yet? Um, those kinds of things. And um, and so when I was first doing community engagement, I felt like, man, these are just a lot of meetings and everybody's just like taking forever. A few years ago, a handful of years ago, I was doing a meeting in Porcupine District. And I remember there was about 115 people that came to that um, that, that that community meeting. And, um, you know, they, we talked about housing, we talked about transportation, education, all these different things. And then I kind of, you know, be, when you're the one who facilitates those meetings, you kind of get like drained and sometimes kind of beat up because <laughs> there's a lot of pressure on you. And I remember just being like drained after one of those meetings. This, um, this Unchi, that means grandma in Lakota, she ended up coming up to me. Um, she was 91 years old. And she came up to me and she said, Takoja, that means grandson. Um, she said, uh, that was the best meeting I ever went to. And I was like, really? I was like, why? And she said, 91 years I lived on this reservation. 91 years I have lived here. Born and raised my, and lived my whole entire life here. But in those 91 years, nobody ever asked me what I wanted for my future. Mm. Nobody ever asked, asked me what I wanted for my children's future or my grandchildren's future. Nobody ever asked those things and meant it. And today, people ask those things to me, and they meant it, and I shared them. And she said, that's why this is the best meeting I ever went to. Something as simple as that, then I realized that through community engagement and engaging our community like that, there was actually a powerful healing process that was happening too. 
It was a process of building trust. It was a, a healing process for people that, that have been disenfranchised. And so that story sticks with me. And so, you know, to the folks that are listening to this podcast and, you know, to people that are trying to do community engagement and things around that to recognize, you know, community engagement and community organizing is something to not check off on a box, but it is something that should fundamentally be a part of everything that you're doing. Um, That is huge for me. And that is one of the things that sticks out to me. And I think that the last thing I'd say, you know, about this um, work to folks that are out there is don't be afraid to dream because it doesn't cost anything to dream. In fact, the cost of not having big, crazy dreams and visions is the status quo of whatever you're living in today. That is the cost of it. So if you want something to change, then there's going to have to be a fire that's lit. And if nobody else is lighting that fire and you're answering, you're thinking about that within yourself, well, that means there's a fire burning inside of you to begin to try to change something differently. And, you know, I've always thought um, that social change, you know, it's not it's not an act of spontaneous combustion. You don't just one day, you know, social change just happens. That, you know, you have to light yourself on fire. And if you light yourself on fire, then you can light the people around you on fire and begin to really build power amongst people. And, you know, the, the last thing I'll say that has been, you know, the true thing that keeps us going is that that the solutions to our problems have to be at least as big um, as the challenges that we're faced with. Because if we don't create solutions that are big enough for the challenges, that means that we're going to keep having perpetual challenges. And so I share those, I share those things with everybody out there who's listening. Hmm. That is uh, such a compelling way to end, uh, Nick. And I wonder, could you... If people are interested in finding out more information about what you are up to, uh, where can they find out that information? Absolutely. Yeah, so thanks for having me on the show. This is great. Um, You can go on the web at thundervalley.org. You can also follow us on Facebook um, at Thunder Valley CDC, our TV CDC, and um, Twitter, Instagram, social media, all those things. Um, and you can, um, you can actually prescribe to our newsletter if you go online. Um, and actually we have a, a, a weekly radio show that you can tune into, uh, on, at keelyradio.com. And I think it's 3 p.m. on Wednesdays, I believe. Um, so yeah, there's multiple ways to engage in our work and find out more about it for sure. We also have a YouTube channel, um, that has, a series of different videos and telling our story and those things can be shared. Wonderful. And if you all are interested in learning more about CityWorks Expo, you can find us at cityworksxpo.com. But Nick, thank you again to so much for taking the time today. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. And, um, you know, it's been an honor, honor to visit with you today and to, 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 to share a few, to share a few things with you. I appreciate the conversation. Once again, thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from City Works Expo. We truly hope you've enjoyed today's episode and come away thinking more deeply about something than you were before. If you have, we'd appreciate a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you might be listening to this. It really helps other people find out about the podcast and the great guests that we have on. Further, I'd like to welcome all of you all to check us out on CityWorksXPO, that's CityWorksXPO.com, and learn about our annual gathering, CityWorks 8, where this year's theme is Anticipating 2050, Acting Today. We're really excited about what we have going on this year and some of the speakers that we have coming in, and we hope you'll join us in Roanoke, Virginia from October 4th through 6th and be part of what's really a very special event. But for now, thanks again for listening and have a great week.